thank you, and thank you so much for the kind introduction. And Jill and I are enormously honoured to be giving the 2019 Jean, Jean Shanks Lecture. Jean Shanks was an eminent and outstanding pathologist, and she was a great benefit, benefactor to medical science. So we're going to talk about Huntington's disease from basic preclinical through to clinical trials. Huntington's disease is a devastating genetic dementia. It's the world's most common genetic dementia. And you can see here, this is a subject, a woman aged 38. And you can see her 13 years later. And you can see the devastating consequences of this disease. It affects people in the prime of life. It's genetic, and we have no treatment. The gene causing Huntington's disease is a CAG repeat expansion in the first exon of the Huntington gene, which codes a protein mutant Huntington, which causes disease through a predominant toxic gain of function. This is a video from our clinical research facility of a patient of mine. She's got still late early stage disease. She's got typical choreiform movement. She's quite dystonic. She's got twisting movements. And people with adult onset Huntington's disease are in constant movement. And Korea comes from the Greek word to dance. She also has the progressive cognitive impairment or dementia and also prominent neuropsychiatric symptoms. And this lady is 46 years old. I also look after lots of youngsters with Huntington's disease. This is a patient of mine, Amar, when he was 16. He's got the more Parkinsonian phenotype of Huntington's disease. Standing behind me is Amar's mum. Her husband died at the age of 32 of Huntington's disease. Amar died when he was 21. His sister died when she was 26. So this lady, who I still keep in touch with, lost her husband and two children to Huntington's disease. And I started working on Huntington's disease in 96, uh, uh, my PhD, a part of it which was done with Jill, and I have been absolutely focused since then on wanting to find treatments. And so this is a review that Jill and I recently did, and here in grey are all the different preclinical pr priority targets for therapeutics. But all of my work and much of Jill's work is focusing really proximally because we want to target Huntington DNA or RNA or as soon as the protein is produced. Because if we can target proximally in brain diseases, we think we've got the best chance of making a difference for these incurable diseases. And this is from a recent review I did, really summarizing the current approaches that we and others are working on to, for therapies for Huntington's disease on Huntington DNA, pre-mRNA, mRNA, and protein. And Jill is going to talk about this in more detail. But what I'm going to talk to you about is the last 10 years of my work focusing on antisense oligonucleotides. Antisense binds to the pre-mRNA. And so antisense molecules are single strands of chemically modified DNA. And they've been chemically modified to allow them to be stable, allow them to type so you can actually use them as a pharmacological small molecule so you can titrate the dose and they can be administered to patients. And so antisense oligonucleotide against Huntington mRNA or the pre-mRNA binds through Watson and Crick base pairing to its complementary scent strand. And that binding leads to uh, the production of a hybrid which is then recognized by the cell's RNA's H1 mechanism, and this hybrid becomes degraded. And the result of that is that you get less translation and less of the toxic protein being made. And so those of you who are interested in medicinal chemistry, this is the structure of antisense molecules. It's a 20 base pair oligonucleotide. It has an MOE structure at either side that allow it to have affinity, stability and able to be tolerated and not elicit an immune reaction. It has a phosphodiester phosphothiate linked backbone, and that backbone allows it to be recognized by the cell's RNA's H1 mechanism, which results in its degradation. MOE ASOs are actually quite large molecules, and you can't, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So to deliver them for brain diseases, they have to be injected intrathecally into the spinal fluid. 
And a lot of our work was on developing the paradigms to be able to do this for human disease, for adult human disease. And antisense molecules have quite long half-lives because of their chemistry, and that allows you to have infrequent dosing. And so the major questions for the program, and I became involved in the program in 2010, was, and the program was started by Don Cleveland and Frank Bennett at a very small biotech company in California. They had screened for molecules that target Huntington and had started mouse work, and then I became involved in 2010 when it was really how do we take this to patients? What preclinical work do we have to do to be able to translate this to human beings? And so the questions for the program, which was a 10-year preclinical program, was can an antisense be designed that potently and specifically reduces Huntington mRNA and protein and affects phenotypic improvement in animal models? Is a non-allele selective approach to treat everyone viable? Is it safe in preclinical toxicology studies? And would an intrathecally delivered antisense molecule get to the parts of the brain where we wanted to get it? And so this is some of the early data. This is antisense infused into the CSF. It's taken up by both neurons and non-neuronal cells equally. This is the antisense, and this is neurons, and this is astrocytes. And antisense molecules bind to pleiotropic cell membrane receptors, and they become endocytosed. And they're very good at um, uh, uh, crossing the membranes of CNS cells. This is some non-human primate preclinical work that we did. And I think importantly, when you're planning a first in human study in the CNS, you want to be able to do large animal work with a CNS structure that most most is most complementary to ours. And this, the CNS structure of the non-human primate is that that is most complementary to the human. And so this was a uh, preclinical program in non-human primates where we dosed the animals with four doses of ASO. This was at 28-day intervals, and the animals were sacrificed one week after the last of the four monthly doses. And this is RNA and protein. This is Huntington levels. And you can see here in the frontal cortex and occipital cortex, key regions affected in Huntington's disease there's about 75 to 80% lowering, hippocampus about 75%, and in the caudate and thalamus, the lowering is about 50%. And these are really deep structures. So the higher the concentration of the ASO, the more you get it to the deep structures. And so I'm not going to really go into detail on the preclinical program, but to really uh, 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 illustrate that it was a 10-year program that the Huntington ASOs decreased Huntington RNA and protein and affected phenotypic improvements in animal models. Intrathecal bolus administration, which we worked up a protocol in multiple large animals. This was tested in dogs, large pigs with spinal cords greater than 50 centimeters, and non-human primates gave broad distribution and activity. We did a toxicology program in non-human primates that lasted up to 15 months. And we also developed a non-human primate pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, pharmacological model, which I will come on and talk about when I show you the data. So the questions for the trial was, would the ASO be safe and well tolerated in patients? Could we get any evidence of getting the antisense to the brain? And could we get any evidence of target engagement with mutant Huntington, which is our target? And what was the best study design? And the study, uh, first in human study, took three years to design. And then in 2015, in September, the first patient to ever receive a Huntington lowering agent received the dose at the National Hospital for Neurology. This was a first in human, multiple ascending dose study design. And it was, uh, we, we designed it as a phase 1B with a phase 2A study wrapped together. We had five dose levels versus placebo. We had three to one active to placebo, and it was quite, we had quite a bit of pushback about having a placebo in a first in man study, but it was important for a number of reasons. And we delivered the drug through an intrathecal lumbar puncture. The primary objective of our trial was to evaluate safety and tolerability of the ASO. The secondary objective was to measure it 
in CSF. And our key exploratory objective, we made it an exploratory objective because we didn't know if we'd get any evidence of target engagement. And that was, could we see any change in CSF mutant Huntington? And this is the study schema. The doses in an ascending dose design were 10, 30, 60, 90, 120, or placebo. The patients came in, baseline CSF sample, day one. They were then given the dose. They came back at day 29, 57, and 85. They had four doses over three months, and then we followed them up for four months afterwards. It was a seven-month study in total, really short study. And we, we had a multiple ascending dose design and an independent data safety monitoring board would review the data from each of the cohorts and tell us whether we could go on to the next dose. The study participants all had early stage Huntington's, stage one disease, earlier stage than the lady I showed in the video. They could give full informed consent. And 34 in the end got active, 12 got placebo, and they were well matched for age, gender, and CAG repeat. So the safety and pharmacokinetics. The ASO was well tolerated at all of the doses. No participants discontinued, which for an invasive delivery procedure where they each had six lumbar punctures was quite impressive. Most of our adverse events were mild and considered unrelated to study drug, and we had post-lumbar puncture headaches after about 10% of lumbar punctures, but we didn't have to give any blood patches. We had no serious adverse events in the active treated group, and we had no clinically meaningful changes in any safety laboratory parameters. And the pharmacokinetics of measuring the ASO showed that we could measure it in plasma and in CSF, and that it was cleared from plasma over about 24 hours. And this is the data showing target engagement. So this is the CSF mutant Huntington change from baseline to last available post-dose time point. This is the CSF mutant Huntington endpoint, placebo 10, 30, 60, 90, and 120. And you can see here there's a very clear dose-dependent lowering of the target CSF mutant Huntington. The mean lowering was about 40%, with some subjects reaching 60% lowering in the higher doses. And this is the CSF mutant Huntington over time. This is CSF mutant Huntington. This is day one dose, day 29, day 57, and day 85. And these were follow-up lumbar punctures. And you can see here, particularly in the 120 milligram dose, that the slope of the subjects, the mutant Huntington is all going, this, they're all getting decreased mutant Huntington. And you can see from the, the graphs that steady state hasn't yet been reached. What we know from animal models is CSF mutant Huntington comes from the brain. It probably comes from dying neurons and dying axons. And so what this told us is that we had got the antisense molecule to the brain in adults. It had interacted with its transcript, and it had lowered the level of the toxic protein. And I mentioned the preclinical PKPD model. And this was a, a preclinical pharmacology model. The, and it was, really, it was very important in designing the trial, and it was highly predictive of the clinical data. And so the model was developed to relate CSF mutant Huntington, which we can measure in patients, to brain mutant Huntington, which we can't. We can't take brain biopsies. And when we, this is the predicted CSF Huntington reduction over time. This is from a pharmacology model. And you can see here, this is the 120 milligram dose. And if your model is correct, if our model is correct, 50% of the subject's data should sit in the shaded region and exactly where they sat. So the PKPD model, which is in the supplementary data of our New England manuscript, was very important in, in being able to uh, predict doses that we should use. We also use the non-human primate model to interpret the clinical data. So a 40% lowering in CSF is predicted to give a cortical tissue lowering of 55 to 70% and 20 to 35% in the deep structure, the chordate. 60% CSF lowering, which some subjects in 120 milligram group reached, is 70 to 85% in the cortex and 35 to 50% in the deep structure of the chordate nucleus. <laughs> 
And that level of CSF mutant Huntington reduction exceeds what we know ameliorates phenotype in, in animal models, which is roughly about 30 to 50% lowering in the cortex. And I think importantly, the planning, the 10 years of planning and the non-human primate PKPD model let us get pharmacologically relevant doses. We also had exploratory clinical outcomes, and this is the composite of motor, cognitive, and function that's used in Huntington's disease. And we found a, a significant correlation with improvement in this composite with lowering of mutant Huntington. I think this is, it was post hoc, it was exploratory, and it requires replication and extension, and it's not evidence of efficacy. But it did help us decide to choose the composite as our phase three endpoint for the phase three. So the conclusions from the trial was that the ASO was well tolerated. We got significant dose-dependent reduction in our target, CSF mutant Huntington, with a magnitude that exceeds what we think ameliorates the phenotype in animal models. The trial was the first demonstration of antisense-mediated protein suppression in the CNS of adults with a neurodegenerative disease. And I'm going to come on at the end, tell you about why that's opened up a vista of treatments for neurological diseases. All of the subjects have gone into an open label extension, and the Antisense program was, was bought by Roche. And Roche have now got an ambitious program. And this is for a rare disease like Huntington's disease, we haven't had that uh, type of investment before. The Roche have an ambitious program to take this forward. They've gone straight from the phase 1B uh, uh, to A study straight to a phase 3 based on the data. There's an a, a natural history study, and this is the phase 3 study. And so the phase 3 study is to see if regular treatment with the antisense slows disease progression in people with symptoms of Huntington's disease. It's the world's most, the largest study ever done with antisense oligonucleotide therapy. It's 801 subjects worldwide, comparing 120 milligrams every eight weeks versus 120 milligrams every 16 weeks versus placebo for 25 months. And that's, um, it's a lot of lumbar punches. And so, Importantly, we're also planning and designing a trial for pre-manifest HD because this is symptomatic disease and we don't know there are many um, uh, uh, numbers of things that can, can come out of a phase three trial for pre-symptomatic symptomatic disease, but we are already planning a trial in pre-symptomatic subjects as well. So this has had enormous, uh, opened up enormous vistas for therapeutics for neurological disorders. The antisense and Huntington's I've told you about. Spinraza is an approved therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. It's a completely different mechanism. It works by upregulating the level of a missing good protein and it's a, a, an approved treatment for children and infants. SOD1 ASO is now in clinical development for ALS, and the early results are promising. There are now clinical trials with tau in Alzheimer's disease and other tauopathies using the same mechanisms of action as the Huntington ASO. Now in preclinical work for Parkinson's disease with alpha-synuclein, and the list goes on. If you have a protein of interest that you think plays a major role in disease pathophysiology, this is a potential way of treating it. It has now been a potential revolution in the treatment of neurological diseases with antisense-mediated uh, uh, suppression of toxic proteins. And I think we now need to see how this moves forward. And I think for someone um, and like Jill and I, have both worked on Huntington's disease for a long time, I think eventually I, I want to be able to do trials in 18-year-olds who are 20 to 30 years before their predicted disease onset, when they're completely well. And I think that's our chance. If we can intervene when they are decades from onset, because we can identify them with a 100% specific genetic test, I think that's our greatest chance of being having true prevention in this disease. And I think that's where we hope we will be. And now I'm going to hand over to Jill, who's going to tell you about ongoing and future work. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Sarah. So you might find it quite surprising that the preclinical part of this talk is following the clinical presentation. But as Sarah told you, the research that underpinned the work that uh, the, the research that underpinned the clinical trials on which she's been leading began in 2005. And our understanding of the pathophysiology of Huntington's disease has advanced considerably since then, and you'd be worried if it hadn't. So what I want to do in the next part of the talk is tell you about two discoveries which are influencing the way we are thinking about developing Huntington lowering strategies going forward. And those are the incomplete splicing of Huntington. Do we need to target more than one transcript? And the genome-wide association studies that have identified uh, DNA repair complexes as uh, genes in DNA repair complexes as genetic modifiers of Huntington's disease. So as you know, the HD gene contains 67 exons and the CAG repeat is within exon 1, as Sarah said. If you have 35 or less CAGs, you will not develop Huntington's disease. If you have 40 or more, this is a fully penetrant mutation and you will develop the disease within a normal lifespan. And alleles of 36 to 39 confer an increased chance of developing Huntington's disease. So if we look at more closely at the <coughs> disease alleles, here you can see there's a clear relationship between increasing CAG repeat length and the onset of the motor disorder. And you can see that this is most pronounced for these early onset cases with onset in childhood or adolescence, as uh, Sarah showed you. But for many of the other alleles, the onset of symptoms can vary by decades for any given CAG repeat size. And we know that this is influenced by both by genetic modifiers and by environmental modifiers. So this gene encodes a large multifunction scaffold protein. The CAG is a polyglutamine tract. And we know, we, our, our, our data suggests that the mutation imparts a gain of function to that protein. So my lab predominantly works with mouse models. And mouse models for hunting disease have been quite successful. They predicted many aspects of the disorder that were, of which we were previously unaware. For example, proteinaceous deposits in the brain or transcriptional dysregulation. And I just want to introduce you to the two types of mouse models that we predominantly work with in our lab. So in one case, the mice are transgenic from a small fragment that just encodes the protein encoded by that exon 1 uh, part of the gene. And so these mice have two copies of normal Huntington, mouse Huntington, plus this additional fragment. And we also work with knock-in models, and these come in various flavors, but essentially the CAG repeat expansion has been put into the mouse gene, so we can work with these as heterozygotes or homozygotes, and they clearly more faithfully replicate the uh, genetic basis of the human disease. If we look at this late-stage disease in these mice, with these small, the uh, R62 line, mice with CAG repeat expansions between 100 and 200 or so would all have end-stage disease around 12 to 14 weeks of age. It's a very rapid disorder. But if we look at the uh, knock-in mice with about 200 CAG, then end-stage disease for them is about 20 months. So clearly, the age of phenotype onset and progression goes much more slowly in knock-in mice. And we made an observation which we published in 2007, which is that if strain background, CAG repeat size, and stage of disease are controlled for, these mouse models look incredibly alike. You can almost put the phenotypes on top of each other. The transcriptional dysregulation profiles are almost identical. And that observation has underpinned most of the work I'm going to tell you about in this first part of the talk, because it made us question, is the disease in the knock-in mice caused by a small fragment of Huntington? So, the HD gene encodes uh, a transcript that is processed to uh, produce a messenger RNA, and we know this encodes this large protein. And we know that this protein undergoes various proteolytic events, and we can see characteristic patterns of proteolytic fragments. And some, so some years ago now, Christian Landels in my lab set out to, make, to do an unbiased analysis of these proteolytic fragments to say where might this... Uh, what might be this causative fragment? Where might it be coming from? And what he found, to our surprise, was that the smallest fragment is an exon 1 protein. And so that made us question, 
Could this have been produced by a splicing event rather than a proteolytic event? So as you all know, pre-messenger RNA is processed by removing the introns between exons and adding a polyadenylation tail into the three prime untranslated region. And these sequences that encode for poly A sites are very frequent in the genome. They're very just six base pair AT rich sequences, so there's a lot of them scattered around, they're scattered in introns. So in some cases, you can activate poly A sites and introns. So in, for example, in this gene where you've had an, um, an alternative splicing event, you can make two transcripts, activating a poly A site at the three prime UTR here and within that intron. Sorry, my... Um, um, and so our hypothesis is that if exon 1 does not always, that within Huntington's disease, exon 1 does not always splice to exon 2, cryptic poly A sites within intron 1 are activated, and we're making a small transcript and a full length transcript. And if that occurred, we know what would happen. So here is the sequence at the end of exon 1. This is the exon 1 intron 1 splice boundary. If exon 1 splices to exon 2, then the first base of exon 2 completes a proline residue. But if it doesn't splice, if this small transcript becomes uh, translated, the first base of the spliced donor completes this proline residue and then there's a stop codon. So this small exon 1 protein doesn't contain any amino acids that are not in the full length protein. And this is how the R62 mice are made because they're transgenic for a genomic fragment at the beginning, at the 5' prime end of the gene. So in order to investigate this further in knock-in mice, we collaborated with David Hausman at MIT and to do RNA sequencing on knock-in mice. And so here I'm showing you a wild-type mouse and a knock-in mouse, and this is the RNA sequencing reads. Here's exon 1 and exon 2. In wild-type, you've got reads over the two exons, but nothing over the intron in between because it's been spliced out. But if we look in the knock-in mice, we, again, we see reads over the exons, and now they're extending into the intron to about 1.2 kb. So to cut a long story short, we were able to show that this, doesn't all, this incomplete splicing event occurs. It produces this small exon 1, intron 1 um, mRNA. That There are cryptic sites, poly A sites, at 680 and 1145 base pairs in the intron that become activated. That this occurs in all brain regions and all peripheral tissues in the mouth and that this small transcript is translated to produce this exon 1 protein. And we also showed that the longer the CAG repeat, the more of this incomplete splicing occurs, so the more of this transcript you produce. And here I'm just showing you some um, independent data from Jim Rosinski at the CHDI Foundation, where he's run a program to do RNA sequencing on many knock-in models. And here you can clearly see that with ext extending CAG repeat length, you have increased intron depth, read depth here, indicative of more incomplete splicing. So why are we interested in this? We knew a lot about this exon 1 protein. We know from many models over the last 20 years that it is very, very pathogenic and it aggregates very readily. If you have a an exon 1 protein with a given polyglutamine repeat in it, it will aggregate much faster than longer fragments of Huntington with the same polyglutamine repeat. So what I'm going to show you here, I'm showing you here, are brain sections from a knock-in mouse at two months of age. And here we've used an antibody to the polyglutamine tract. So when the polyglutamines aggregate, the, poly, they, the polyglutamines become buried in the amyloid structures. And so an antibody to polyglutamine can't see them. So if you just do this immunohistochemistry to this section, you see no signal. But if we pre-treat those sections with formic acid to break open the hydrogen bonds between the polycues, and then the antibody can see these structures, then it tells us where the aggregated protein is. And here, this is just at two months of age in mice that would not, you wouldn't be able to tell they were symptomatic till beyond 12 months of age. And you can see at low power already the striatum and areas of the cortex are full of aggregated product. product. And if we go to higher power, probably every medium spiny neuron in the, uh, in the striatum of these mice has aggregation, this aggregated product in its nucleus. So we've also been able to show that increased levels of incomplete splicing in knock-in mice are correlated with earlier onsets of phenotypes. 
So just bear with me again, just for some more knocking mouse um, schematics. So essentially, this is representing two knocking mice and the way that they've been made differently. So in this instance, we've just got the CAG repeat put into exon one of the mouse gene. There's no other, no other alterations to that gene. And in the other case, exon one of the mouse gene has been replaced with exon one of the human gene with a very long C with a, a CAG repeat. When everything else is equal, strain background, CAG repeat size, etc., this construct produces more incomplete splicing and more transcript than this one. And we know when that happens, we produce more of the transcript, we get more of the exon one protein. We see earlier um, onset of this aggregated protein in the striatum and we see earlier onset of behavioral phenotypes. So in summary, Huntington is incompletely spliced to generate this exon one mRNA. This, the level of this increases with CAG repeat size. This small mRNA is translated to produce this exon one protein. We know that's very pathogenic and aggregates very readily, and that phenotypes in knocking mice are correlated with the level of this small transcript. So does this happen in patients, in, in um, humans? So here we're looking at the human gene. We've got exon 1 again, exon 2. In the human intron, the cryptic poly-A sites are predicted to be at 2.7 and 7.3 kb into the intron. And in order to be able to detect these intronic sequences, we set up assays very close to these poly-A sites. We looked at, we had post-mortem brains from six early onset cases from Rick Myers in Boston with CAG repeats expanding from 67 to 136, from 12 brains from adult onset HD from Richard Fall in New Zealand, and four control brains. And we looked at the somatosensory cortex, the hippocampus, and the cerebellum. So here I'm showing you the cortex, hippocampus, cerebellum. These four, these, uh, four um, markers here all indicate those four assays. And the blue dots indicate the level of intron sequences in the early onset brains. So as you can see, we can in, when we have highly expanded CAGs, we can clearly see evidence of incomplete splicing in these brains. With the adult onset CAGs, we now know we have some more sensitive assays I don't have time to, to go into, but the level of incomplete splicing isn't a lot more with the CAG repeat in the, early, in the adult onset than in the normal range, but it's not the RNA that we are trying to say is the toxic species here. It's the protein that's produced from this small RNA that then has a polyglutamine repeat that will aggregate. So now I just want to go on and tell you about the other story, which is the genome-wide association studies. And this is related to somatic instability of the CAG repeat. So we showed back in 1997 that when you look in the brains of knocking of these R62 mice, that the CAG repeats are very unstable, and in certain brain regions, they are now they've they've um, ch changed their size. The size has changed. The distribution of size is much wider, and that also happens in peripheral tissues. And so there's a, there's this distinct pattern of somatic instability of the CAG repeat in uh, tissues, which which increases with disease progression or the age of the mice. And it's very characteristic between, um, between tissues and brain regions and tissues and um, is very consistent between different mouse models. And so you can see here, this, here, this is the mode. That's the most frequent CAG of 202. And each one of these peaks is adding another one. So 202, 203, 204. And when we look in certain uh, uh, brain regions and uh, tissues, you can see this is much more spread out. And we showed in 2008 that this CAG repeat in, in um, brains expands in non-dividing neuronal cells. So the first real evidence that this occurs in patient brains was from Peggy Shelbourne in 2003 um, so in post-mortem brains, here from somebody who has a CAG of 41 in their blood and here 51 in their blood. She used a method called small pool PCR, which allows her to look at single DNA molecules and you can see that within these, some of these brain regions, she could detect CAG expansions up to 1,000 CAGs in some cases, or several hundred, so that we know that this is occurring in the patient brains. 
So we've known for a long time that in mice that this is associated with the mismatch repair process. Anne Messer, the very first genetic cross that was done with our R62 mice was by Anne Messer, and she published in 1999 that if you knock out MSH2, you prevent this somatic instability from occurring. And over the years, others have shown that this is also true of other mismatch repair uh, genes. And so it was extremely exciting when in 2015, the first genome-wide association study that was properly powered and is reproducible showed that under a couple of the peaks there were DNA repair genes. And over the last four years, this uh, story has continued, um, Sarah was able to show in a more targeted study that MSH3 is a genetic modif modifier for disease, uh, onset, disease progression in some patients. Uh, the Lee lab showed that uh, MLH1 is a genetic modifier for onset. And we now have, in the more uh, um, recent GWAS, six uh, DNA repair genes, most, four of which are part of the mismatch repair um, complex. So in summary, we think that, so in summary, there are two transcripts produced from the HD gene, a full-length transcript and the small exon 1 transcript. The exon 1, this is translated to produce an exon 1 protein. We know that that um, diffuses into the nucleus. It contains a highly potent nuclear export signal, so it gets um, expelled. And it stays there because it becomes an aggregated, com forms aggregated complexes, and it causes transcriptional dysregulation. We th expect, we think, that the exon 1 protein probably nucleates aggregation in the cytoplasm, where it may also recruit other Huntington fragments it's this aggregation process that causes um, neuronal dysfunction and, in some cases, neuronal cell death. And the uh, protease stasis network becomes impaired, which provides a feedback loop which exacerbates this process. So we know that the longer the CAG repeat, the greater the level of incomplete splicing. So the longer the CAG, the more of this is, that is produced. And genetic modifiers act to degree, decrease somatic expansion and therefore reduce the amount of this that is produced. So our, our incomplete splicing story provides a direct link between the genetic modifiers and the production of this pathogenic exon 1 protein. So you've heard a lot of detail about the antisense oligonucleotide um, trial that Sarah has been so involved in organizing and in monitoring and conducting. Um, but there are several therapies that are now moving towards the clinic, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about some of those and then some to and end with what we're trying to do to complement that. So here, we use, this um, was something that Sarah showed earlier. So here we have the uh, HD gene. Um, it makes two transcripts. These are exported from the nucleus. They're translated to produce an exon 1 protein, a full-length protein, which is also proteolytically digested. So at the DNA level, the CHDI Foundation have been working with Sangamo, or were working with Sangamo for many years, and they have developed zinc finger proteins that will act to repress the transcription of the Huntington gene. And these are specifically targeted at the mutant allele and not the normal allele. And Takeda is currently taking that, that um, forward to the clinic. Uh, there are many groups now starting to work with CRISPR-Cas9, but all of that is at the preclinical stage. The possibility of targeting DNA repair proteins to indirectly affect the length of the CAG repeat has captured many people's imagination, and there's a whole plethora of small companies that have just started to work on this. It's a very crowded space. But Sarah and I are currently working with the Ionis Pharmaceuticals to characterize antisense oligonucleotides that target MSH3. And I just wanted to mention something else here which we don't fully understand at the moment. So the antisense oligonucleotide that Sarah has mentioned that targets the full-length transcript has been shown by Jeff Carroll in mice and Sarah in cells. It appears to reduce the level of somatic expansion and the level by which the CAG repeat increases. We don't understand that at the moment, but it's very interesting because that would be expected to also decrease the level of this transcript. At the RNA level, you've heard a lot about from um, 
uh, Sarah about uh, antisense oligonucleotides from Roche, which target the full length transcript and both the normal and the mutant alleles. WAVE also have a program going towards the clinic targeting full length transcript, but in this case, just the mutant version, a more personalized therapy. There are several gene therapy approaches that are currently moving towards the clinic. Um, Unicure have uh, RNAIs which target the, the beginning of the Huntington gene, so would hit both of these transcripts. Voyager and Spark have ones that detect the full length transcript. These and the zinc fingers need to be administered via AAVs, and that's a disadvantage at the moment because they uh, will all just be targeting the chordate nucleus, and those uh, the uh, it, um, they, they will not distribute in the same way as the ASOs that Sarah has talked about. And there's a, a, a Novartis have a small molecule that targets the full length transcript, which is also, they're starting to move towards the clinic. So into nor in order to complement this, we are um, interested in trying to find, trying to develop treatments that will also target that small messenger RNA. We think it's most likely that we will need to target both of these transcripts. So we're for oligonucleotide approaches, we're working with Frank Bennett to try and develop more ASOs that would target the small transcript for degradation by RNAs H, as Sarah said, also prevent polyadenylation and also thereby target it for degradation. And if we were successful in identifying anything that could be taken to the clinic, the uh, interesting thing is that they could also then be administered uh, in theory with the ASO that Sarah's already tested. Anastasia Korvova at University of Massachusetts has chemically modified siRNAs to make them stable um, in uh, tissues and conjugated them such that they distribute very well through the brain, even the primate brain. And that's very, um, so we're working with her and that's the furthest along at the moment in terms of proof of principle. Both Novartis and Roche were able to identify small molecules that would target the U1 spliceosome complex to the splice donor of exon 7 in the SMN gene for spinal muscular atrophy and thereby keep, retain exon 7. And we're trying to copy their approach and see if we can find a small molecule that would tether the U1 complex to the splice donor of exon 1 and um, to increase the level of splicing. And we're doing this with Paul Whiting at UCL Drug Discovery Institute. We developed a small mini gene system whereby Ranilla luciferase would be a reporter for the small transcript and the Firefly for the spliced version. Paul has turned that into a splice, into a, a screening assay, and he's working with AstraZeneca and they've screened just over a quarter of a million compounds and um, removed false positives through counter screens and now um, have progressed to, we're progressing to um, assays to try and confirm activity. So in summary, thematic CAG repeat expansion increases the level of this small transcript, providing a direct link between genetic modifiers for HD and the production of this highly pathogenic exon 1 protein. We think we don't know, but we think that it might be, we might need to be able to target both transcripts. But this observation that Sarah and Jeff have made, that the ASO that's already in the clinic can, in mice and cells, act to lower the level of the CAG repeat expansion is extremely tantalizing. So we're going to be awaiting the results of the Roche Phase 3 Generation HD1 trial, and meanwhile to continue to work on these complementary approaches, and I guess that's three years away. And we, or Sarah, is working towards testing these therapies in young adult HD gene carriers decades before symptom onset, as she said so that we hope that in the future we can move to true disease prevention. So I'm just going to leave you with the members of our HD Centre at the Institute of Neurology at UCL. Thank you.